Hello, dear friends. We are opening the doors and letting you in. I see the number of participants is growing, just a couple of seconds. So welcome to Vessel Performance Optimization Webinar brought to you by Digital Ship. Today you learn everything you need to know about setting up the Fleet Remote Control Center. Our guest speakers will share their best knowledge with you very shortly. Let me welcome a team of IV Marine. So the first speaker, Katerina Serini, she is the head of strategic partnership, Matteo Barsotti, senior consultant of InfoShip Performance, and Gempiero Sancini, CEO of IB Marine. Uh, this webinar is sponsored also with, uh, uh, by IB Marine. We encourage you to ask a lot of questions. It's important element of our webinars. And we will start off with Carl Jeffrey, founding editor of Digital Ship, who will give a short introduction into what we mean by Fleet Remote Control Center. Okay, thanks. So one thing we've learned in our vessel performance webinars is that the subject of vessel performance can be split up in many different ways. So we've done events on data gathering and communications. We've done events on data algorithms and modeling. We've done events on data management and we've done events on rolling up the data for large fleets. But what I think is special today is the focus is on the organization, the shipping company, how you're going to manage the performance of the fleet. So we're totally orientated around the organization, not the technology today and the most important part of that from the organization's point of view is situation awareness you have to know what's going on where your emissions are what's causing them and other things you need to do to make decisions about them so the concept we're going to present is a called a fleet remote control center so it it can be a physical place in the shipping company which is a room where all the data comes in it doesn't necessarily have to be a physical place but a lot of shipping companies are choosing to make it a physical place so the shipping company technical or performance managers can go in and see what they need to know what's, to, what's going on. So if we decided that's what we're going to build, then we want to work backwards from that. We've got to access data, uh, gather the data together, model the data, and find out what we need to know. So the hardest part, you've got lots of data sources. You might not necessarily get access to the data you want. There might be disputes with equipment owners about who owns the data, or you find it locked in proprietary protocols. Next stage is modeling the data to find out how the vessels are performing, getting alerts about problems and making predictions like how much bunkers you're going to need and uh, questions like what you're going to do with the equipment and when to do maintenance. So it's a big project. It involves hardware, software, analytics. But once you've got it all working, it can mean a big change to the way you manage the entire fleet. So First of all, we're going to hear today from Katerina Serini, who's responsible for strategic partnerships and business development at IB Marine. She's been working in maritime software for more than 15 years. She's going to give an overview about how shipping companies should choose their digital tools and what IB Marine has to offer. Second, we're going to hear from Matteo Barsotti, who's senior consultant at InfoShip Performance at IB Marine. So, He's actually done, done this work himself. He's just left a tanker shipping company with 65 tankers at the end of April. And he's going to share his experience on the best way to set up a fleet remote control center and what sort of information is useful every day to reach your longer term targets. And finally, we have Gian Piero Sancini, who's the CEO of IB Marine. He's going to explain how to go about the tasks of gathering data from the ships, from the sensors, monitoring devices and manual reports and some of the challenges he's seen and how to overcome them. And if anybody doesn't know John Piero, he's perhaps got more experience with maritime software than anybody else in the world, including managing the world's largest maritime software company from May 2005 to October 2016. So I'd like to welcome Katerina to give the first talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl, for the good introduction. Hello, good morning, good day, everybody. Let me share my screen to start the presentation. Can you see it? Yes, it's not okay. in presentation view yet. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Okay, thank you again. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Just let me introduce a little bit IB for those uh, who don't know us. IB is an uh, Italian-based company 
who has been acquired last January by Ariba Tech Group, a uh, Norwegian IT uh, company listed at the Oslo Stock Exchange. Uh, we started our, our job in the, in the, in the 80s. Uh, the core solution of InfoShip uh, of um, uh, of IB is InfoShip, a system uh, web-based software suitable for any kind of ship designed to bring a high level of fleet control. But today we are talking about InfoShip performance for the fleet performance, which is the backbone of uh, our um, control room. Why choosing, to, uh, why choosing to implement a, system, um, a project like, like FORCE? Well, for several reasons, indeed. Uh, today, there is a, a strong need in shipping of monitoring and controlling um, um, all data related to the fleet performance. And, but there are also, from the other side, lots of difficulties for the ship owners, for the ship managers in, uh, in, that they are facing in adopting the correct, the, the best solution uh, by choosing among um, a profusion of systems, uh, different standards, different protocols, uh, um, different softwares on the market. It is a, a complex uh, project indeed, um, but the, the main reason uh, to answer the question of why implementing such uh, a project are, are three, to my opinion. Uh, there, are, there is an operational aspect to be considered, having uh, at the fingertips uh, all the um, available data in terms of emissions, of consumption, of the uh, engine status, the hull status, all the assets, uh, monitoring on board the room, monitoring the weather condition. It's something that can really boost the performance of the ship. And then there is also a financial reason because um, uh, financial transparency brings the ship's actual um, profitability. For example, uh, having real-time data of fuel consumption uh, gives you a better understanding whether the ship financial situation can or must be improved. And last but not least, an environmental aspect, because uh, we know that a regular uh, monitoring of the energy consumption can uh, unveil uh, inefficiencies uh, and provide uh, thus uh, continuous improvement. This is an example of a, a fleet remote control center. Uh, of course, it's not a matter of uh, gathering data. I mean, our data collector installed on board can collect thousands of data every five seconds. And Matteo uh, will go through this uh, topic in detail in a while. But um, I would say it's not a matter of uh, gathering data, but data must be updated, must be uh, get it in, uh, get in, uh, in uh, high quality, uh, well visualized uh, and uh, uh, with a high frequency. And our system is able to um, learn with the machine learning algorithms and, uh, and uh, to, 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 um, by having historical data uh, to do all the uh, and, and get back all the analytics and the trends and the statistics based on the user's needs. So in a nutshell, a real-time monitoring of the vessel performance uh, can really uh, boost and improve the efficiency of a vessel uh, by having accurate information uh, meaning uh, translating data into meaningful information. The system is very flexible because all the uh, features and functionalities and modules can be tailored again based on what the, the client needs. Let me also say that uh, we are not alone in this, uh, in this journey. We are partnering with uh, some uh, uh, of the major key players in our um, maritime ecosystem, like Immersat, for example. We can get data also from their data logger installed on board and make all the analysis and the statistics uh, uh, for, the, for the final user. Uh, I, I think I can, get the, I can let the floor to Matteo. 
right now and uh, I'm available for any further questions or comments. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. So now I invite Matteo Barsotti to speak. Yes. Okay. I don't uh, know what I'm doing. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I cannot. <laughs> Sorry, one second. Give me questions. It's always like that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I hope that you can see my screen now. Yes, <laughs> Sorry. Okay, now the question is, what are the data needed to at least start uh, for a fleet remote control center? Here we have a minimum set of data. Data coming from the navigation side, like the speed. Speed can be over ground and through the water. Loading condition, like draft and displacement. Position in terms of GPS position, latitude and longitude and direction and distance, both over ground and through the water in order to evaluate this, the percentage of sleep. From the automation side, we have the power, power coming from the main engine or main engines on in general propulsion engines, RPM from propeller or propellers, and consumption coming from flow meters available for each emission source. Generation can be related to the power of the auxiliary engine or the steam produced by the boilers. Weather is an important data, is considered a sort of hybrid data because it could be derived from a sensor on board, like for example, the anemometer for the wind or from visual observation, like usually for the sea or also from an external provider. But moving in details, of course, on board there are a lot of equipment that are responsible for many different types of system. As also we said before, the system, our system is able to receive thousands of data with a frequency of up to five seconds. And this is related to the fact that up, the, the more we gather, the better it is. Because in this way, we can combine all together, all different type of equipment that are responsible, different type of system and combined in only one integrated solution. The more, the better, as I said, because this help and this we enable the user to achieve all the goals for our system that we speak about in a minute. Here we have the data collector. The data collector is the responsible one of collecting automatically all the data on board. Autocal automatically means without any human intervention. Of course, it has to be set before the installation by the technicians, but we have a lot of experience in that because we have plenty of installation during dry dock or even for a retrofitted vessel, even in port with very short notice and very short time. So we have a lot of experience also in different type of automation system, navigation system, but also different type of equipment and, of, and the system that maybe were installed after the delivery of the vessel, so are not connected to the automation. And this enables us to gain a lot of experience in different output, like the NIA output, uh, Modbus, or OPC, or also the analogic ones, like milliampere and pulse. This is a real example of uh, data collector. Usually is presented like this with a PC on the top, and below all the uh, MOXA converter that are able to convert all the data to, uh, to the industrial PC. Sometimes in case of retrofit, there is another tool that is usually mounted uh, in, the, in the bridge in order to acquire all the data from the navigation. This part is usually installed in the ACR, but also it depends on the configuration of the vessel which are the goals of this solution. The first goal is the compliance. Compliance first on the emission regulation, like for, the, for example, the well-known IMO DCS and uh, MRV regulation and China data collection, plus all the uh, emission regulation that may will come from the UK and USA if confirmed. 
plus all the, all the metrics that may will come as a result of the next MPC at the end of June. Compliance means also compliance with any commercial needs, like, for example, uh, a fixed ETA, or compliance for a, with a charter party clause for a speed and consumption in a predefined good weather definition. Compliance is, can be also related to, to, to some audit, like, for, exa for example, the TMSA for uh, the tanker fleet. Second goal is assessment. Assessment on the performance of the vessel in general, but of course related to the efficiency. We can perform a different type of efficiency. Again, is related to the type and the quantity of data that we receive. We can perform efficiency on speed and power and consumption, sure, but also depending on the type of the vessel, uh, we can perform different type of uh, efficiency, like uh, the, the efficiency of a, an electric load plan for a cruise vessel. The second assessment could be on the alerting. Alerting means on a single component, and we can evaluate its failure if we do not receive any more the, the signal, or if we can evaluate for a certain period the historical data, we can evaluate its maintenance. Alerting is related also on the alerting on the HAL and the propeller performance. This is possible through its pillar, that is the ISO 19030, that help with the HER4 KPI, with the in-service performance, dry docking performance, maintenance effect and performance, and the last, that is the most cost-effective one, that is the uh, maintenance trigger, or in other words, the way, when is the best time to clean the HAL and or the propeller. One thing about uh, the ISO 19030 is that one of the requirements is to have a very large number of data. And this means that it's almost impossible to build a compliant system with ISO 19030 with only manual data. Assessment part three is related to the optimization. And again, it's not possible to have a very good optimization with only manual data. Optimization in terms of weather routing in general, or speed optimization, or again, trim optimization. Third goal, knowledge, last but not least, knowledge means having control. And that is exactly where it fits our system, our solution, our forms. With our solution, we we'll have a decision support system that is of course linked to the optimization, to the alerting and to the efficiency. And this is exactly the idea behind our solution without, behind our force. Let's see how it works for us. Force, as we said, have the data collector on board, collecting all the data coming from all different types of equipment and system, system, and through the data transfer, make this data available not later than five minutes into the InfoShip Performance Database on board. Please note that it's possible to enrich the database on shore with any uh, manual input. This, the InfoShip uh, performance database will collect all the data coming from all the fleet, from all the vessel, and create through the algorithm of the machine learning and all the analytics, all the different type of dashboard that are available in our solution, in our force. Now we will have a look on some very few examples. The first one is the fleet map where it's possible to have a look on the real position of the vessel. And we can add some layers. For example, the first one is the weather layers, where it's possible to see the wind, wave, and current uh, intensity and direction, plus the ice map, that is the last one that we added. The second layer that is possible to add is the uh, area layer. Here we added, for example, the uh, ICA area, but we can add many more area depending on the customer request. And it is important to say that we can activate some alerting on the area if you are entering or if you are inside the area. Second example is a predefined KPI dashboard. Here is presented the propulsion one. We, we can select for a single period, for a, a specific period and a specific or a specific voyage, and have a look in only one screen on the averages of the consumption, of the speeds, and uh, uh, of the power, plus all the uh, information about the weather. 
in terms of uh, averages, but also in terms of different sea state encountered by the vessel during the specific voyage or period. The third example is a not a predefined one, but is a dedicated dashboard. This is, for example, for a superintendent. We put the uh, mimic of the, vessel, of the main engine, plus some tiles and gauges related to the real-time data, plus some trend line and scatter diagram in order to evaluate the period. The superintendent, in this case, can evaluate at a glance in only a few minutes the status of the main engine and, in case, take decision. And that is exactly a very good example of a decision support system. Immediately can take decision. Of course, this is just very few examples. The, uh, the all different type of dashboard can be tailored on the customer needs. Of course, is again related to the fact of the data that we gather. The more is the better. Last, I want to, we want to show you a case scenario, an experience that we have with one of our customers. For this customer, we uh, acquire the data from the temperature for each cylinder of the main engine exhaust gas. And during the presentation of this kind of, uh, of dashboard, the customer immediately understand that something was not good on the cylinder number three, because the temperature was higher than the averages of the, of the others. So this led the customer immediately to take the decision to perform some checks and corrective maintenance on board. And then the problem was solved. This is a very, another very good example of the decision support system because the problem was solved. The customer was, of course, more than happy because save money and time. And this is possible with our solution, with only one, our solution, because we gather a lot of data. And I repeat, the more, the better. Now, I will leave the floor to Giampiero for the last part of, my, of our presentation. Oh, very good. I'd like to welcome John Piero then. You there, John Piero? Oh, yes, yes. I, I was desperately trying to look for the unmute button. Okay, so um, you, you basically saw a very, very short overview of what the system does. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't show many other things. We didn't show how we, we can connect to every single engine on board, we can uh, verify the temperature, the exhaust gas temperature, the pressure of everything in the line. We can essentially bring the fleet back to the office. And why do we want to do this and why we are doing it with uh, several very large customers? Well, the idea initially was uh, simply to overcome some of the hurdles of plant maintenance. Uh, it started with the idea of, uh, you know, plant maintenance has always had the issue of uh, creating databases which nobody wanted to pay for, the cumbersome of, of trying to implement condition-based maintenance with vibration monitoring sensors and, and, and so on. And even if technically it, is, it has been possible since uh, 30 years, it was complicated, it was complex, it was very expensive. Today is possible at a, an extremely uh, reduced price, and it is possible to take every single navigation data, every single data coming from the engine, from the shaft, from the propeller, including the azipods, you know, including taking the temperature and the vibration readers, readings on, on the Azipos, and bring them ashore and analyze them and have the machine, have the software do all the needed analysis and essentially intervene by exception. So to have the system trained in such a way that it brings to our attention only the items which need our attention. We are not flooded with information. Sorry, we are not flooded with data. We are receiving the information when we need to take action. And this is the very, very big change. And of course, COVID has made this even more, let's say, necessary, because in the past, we used to send uh, surveyors and inspectors all over the planet, and even balancing sometimes the, uh, some uh, deficiencies from, from the crews. Today, to send somebody on board has become horrendously difficult and expensive, and in some places, purely impossible. 
But what has become very easy and very possible is to bring data ashore to be analyzed and verified. The idea then of having a, a control room, of course, is, uh, is a facility. Uh, you don't need it. You can have it on your computer. You can have it on your mobile. You can literally open the mobile or open a, an, I, an iPad and take a look at the, the vessels, identify from a color code, which is yellow, red, and green, if the vessel has an issue, and then you press on your mobile and it tells you immediately, you know, consumption is above, uh, fuel consumption is above the charter rate, or the vessel is, is late, or the weather condition where the vessel is going, and the system is advising on a different route, on a different uh, position. And this, I repeat, is made not only possible from a technical point of view, but much easier than what most people think. Of course, the advantage also of having hardware, this is an era where I insist a lot because there are a lot of companies now offering a sort of performance analysis based on known report. Well, with our system, we take about 17,280 readings a day of one, one point. We take normally on a cruise vessel between 900 and 2000 points. So the number of data that we have available to analyze is, in, is immense. And that means precision. And that means real digitalization because otherwise if you simply take data once a day, it's not digitalization. It's you're simply digitizing some processes like converting a spreadsheet or into a PDF. It's not digitalization. Reading from PDF files is not digitalization. So why we want to do it? Because this way is the, the future way. When I started to do my job with, um, with Amos and Spectre in 1988, we were selling computerized maintenance management system. Ever people were sort of laughing, we don't need this. We have continuous machinery survey. And we were the first ones going around showing a software on a computer telling, you know, how to do plant maintenance or what to do in case of plant maintenance. After 33 years, I have to admit that there is a much better way to do not only plant maintenance, but every control that you need to have on the vessel. And this is by using performance monitoring system and by using um, fleet control systems. That is basically it. I've noticed uh, some very interesting questions. And uh, if Carl is in agreement, I would like to start, uh, you know, replying to them. Yeah, just first of all, so on this, whether we're talking about a service or a product, I mean, all, all the questions seem to be assuming we're talking about technology product, but you, you presented it obviously is always half of one and half of another, but I think it's far more of a service than an actual product. Do you want to, is that something you want to? Well, I mean, it's, we, we deliver the software today is always delivered as a software as a service. So yesterday, for the first time, I was even talking with a ship owner who told me, why don't you deliver a fleet remote operating center as, as a solution? So basically you offer this service to, uh, to other companies. I don't know if you will reach that. I think that companies normally are very, um, um, very egoistic about their data or, or very protective about their data. And I think it should be like this. You know, installing a system like this is, is entirely about managing data. And sometimes we have hurdles, we have uh, issues, okay? Uh, not always we find on, on board the kind of equipment. I just noticed a, a, a question from Philippe uh, Leung. Is it a must to have a flow meter? Of course, if you want to have fuel consumption, if you have really want to have fuel consumption, if you don't have a flow meter, it's useless. You basically don't do it. So when we go on board, and an example is we, we are doing the computerization of a fleet of uh, 100 plus tankers. The first thing that we did is we analyzed the hardware on board of every single ship. And we came out that about of out of these 100 vessels, about a good 20% had absolutely nothing on board that allowed us to digitize them digitalize them. And that meant spending per each one of them about $50,000. And, and, and then he went all the way through the ones that we didn't have to do anything. In some of them, we didn't even put, uh, have to put the data collector on board. We simply had to con connect with the data collector already existing. But in total, the kind of hardware update that they had to do was about a million dollars. On average, it was about $10,000 per vessel. 
Okay, so this is something that, for instance, you have to be aware of. It's not only a matter of linking a software and then everything works. To go on board and link to the automation system is more complicated than to the navigation one because navigation is entirely based on MR0183, so you basically have no problems. But as uh, as Matteo uh, stated very well, you go on board of a, of a ship and you find the automation, which is uh, uh, OPC based. Uh, another one is mode bus. Another one is TCP IP. And in some cases, we found them locked. So the automation company has locked the data when not encrypted the data. And then you start having an argument because the ship owner wants us to go ahead. We call the automation company. The com company says, oh, I want money. And in two cases, we, get, we got the automation company asking $10,000 to open the channel. Another example is that we have um, charters wanting our, our, our system. Actually, it's in their interest. So this is increasing a lot. But uh, Shippon is uh, asking for us, are you going to interfere with the automation system? Because the automation company guarantee will expire. Of course, we don't interfere at all, at all. We simply read data. But then in some cases, the engine manufacturer says, oh, why, how, what do you do with our data? Our data is ours. And the ship owners had to intervene and say, no, the ship data is mine because I'm, I paid for the bloody engine. Therefore, it's mine. And don't you dare not give in the data or the data well, to, 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 to IB. So it is, there are a lot of issues and which require a lot of planning when you start doing a fleet of 100 ships. Yeah, I mean, what, what I think is interesting, I, well, I imagine most shipping companies see so many products and they think it's a sort of beauty contest where they have to choose between different products. But what actually people need is a, is a service, I think, which is kind of what you're presenting here. It's more of a service to make everything work rather than an actual product, isn't it? Well, I, I suppose, as I said, we, we deliver we deliver a system which is tailored for the fleet or tailored for, for the ship. But I mean, the tailoring is more in the office for the KPIs. It is uh, up to the office to start saying, we want to compare identical ships. We want to compare identical engine. Why is the ship doing the same route over and over again, consuming 3% or 4% or 5% more fuel than this other ship in the same route? Is that a fault of uh, the supplier? Is that the fault of the chief engineer? Is that the captain who has fun in, in going you know, too, 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 too fast? In some cases, we have been requested from uh, from a company, to, from one of our biggest customers, to, to basically uh, advise them on a mobile if the shipping is slow, was slowing down too much because they had episodes of smuggling, you know, when, when, when the ships were uh, navigating, let's put it this way. So, uh, so if we go to the top of the list, so Peyota Bealek is the digital solutions manager with ABB. So he's asking about uh, Onboard user interface, data storage on board, and you collaborate with any automation system provider. Is that a, I don't know who wants to answer that one. I, I can reply, of course. So everything that you have ashore is also on board, and everything is stored on board and uh, transmitted ashore. The only thing is that ashore, you have a lot more of KPIs, let's say, or, or the, the people ashore can compare ships, while the people on board of their ship, they can only look at their ships. OK. so. Uh, Doug Holden is asking about um, the trend to... Oh, oh wait, uh, Piotr had, uh, had another question. How do you acquire automation data? From a technical point of view, do you collaborate with any automation system provider? We, we work with them all. We have done installation with more than 22 different uh, automation providers, including some I never heard of. Um, some of them are very easy and we have an excellent relationship with. And some others are very difficult and we don't have a very good relationship with. Sometimes it's funny because we found flaws in their system, especially in the data transfer. And uh, so we have been able to identify much before them that they had faulty PCBs on board because we could see that the, the flow was not constant. And that is interesting because of course, in case of problems, uh, you definitely have, uh, you know, the, the, our system will, will tell you and say, hey, the, the data flow is not correct. You're, you're missing data continuously. And that is important because uh, it makes a difference between being able to, to intervene before uh, uh, you have a problem. Uh, the, the advantage of collecting data all the time is that we, we work a lot on trends. And that is much better than working a lot on al alarms and alerts, even if our system has a completely configurable alert and alarm uh, system. 
Oh, okay. So Douglas Holden is asking about the data storage in the cloud and which country is it stored in? Is that, or are you storing the data yourselves? Uh, so we, we, we offer everything. We offer Azure, Amazon, uh, storing ourselves and storage in the countries of uh, where the, the, the owner is or storing, storing at, uh, at the owner premises, even if it is cloud, of course. Uh, we are working with, with nations that don't uh, always want uh, or customers do not, do not want to work with American companies, let's put it this way. And therefore, you know, we, we need to be extremely flexible. One of, of the advantages of being owned by Aribatech is that they have a, a cloud, uh, a company providing very advanced cloud solutions. So we, we work with them. Okay, so Vladimir Kozlov, I'm just looking at his LinkedIn page. So he used to be in the maintenance de development department of uh, Carnival Maritime in Hamburg. So we've got a three complex. <laughs> What's well, data architecture? Sounds like a very long question. Um, is there any AI involved in it? Is that a easy so, question? Um, again, uh, Matteo, interrupt you if you want to say something. Okay, but uh, the data, so everything is written in Java and uh, Angular. And uh, it is uh, entirely cloud-based, cloud, uh, cloud -based, but we have some um, methodology, let's say, as I said before, to store everything in case there is a, a lack of connectivity, uh, the system doesn't stop at all. Simply when there, actually we have all testing, the, the system has been in operation for now close uh, five years actually. And therefore we have a lot of issues when we had uh, disconnecting and we had the spikes of data being transmitted and recognized. So that is not an, uh, an issue. And uh, oops, the question just, uh, oh no, there it is. Just to be clear, uh, Data Lake Data Warehouse, uh, Data Fabric, RDBMS, etc. Uh, honestly, this I don't know, we can reply, I can reply in private asking the IT people because uh, I don't know. I know we use MongoDB for a lot of, uh, you know, the the storing uh, parts, but uh, of course we we can support any any uh, any solution. How many iOS can the system support? I think we support both, uh, uh, you know, the the how do you call it, Android and uh, uh, Apple o OS plus, of course, every Microsoft solution. It's, it's typical of Java, let's say. Oh, okay. So Philip Lung is a, so we, you're still using the Noom reports or automated data? I guess you're using whatever so no, they have available. No report is done completely automatic. We, uh, all, all the voice data reporting uh, is done completely automatically. Uh, we, if, you, if you also get the electronic logbooks uh, that we provide, we have uh, deck and engine logbooks and every, we, we try to remove as much as possible everything which is manual for many reasons. One is that this way we don't have mistakes, but me also this way we free, we free the crew from a very stupid job. Wow, so we've got a stinky question from George Paul Perantzakis. I think he's with Naftamar, I think, but uh, so he's asking uh, any the clue negligence cause an insurance claim. It's a very complicated question, George Paul. I think we have to <laughs> take a little while to think through now, this one. <laughs> it's, it's so interesting because I'm currently running into a, uh, in between, in between a charterer, the owner, and the ship management company in a very large contract. And of course, it is uh, an issue because our system does, cannot lie <laughs> because we take data as they are and there is no way you can tamper with them. Uh, for instance, I mean, what happened to the, what was the name of this oh, evergreen ship? I always called it ever ready, but it <laughs> <laughs> ever there or whatever. Uh, vessel. I mean, we would have been able, of course, uh, to do, to provide much more data than the, the, the data which uh, an AIS or a VDR can, can provide, because we would have been able to correlate the position of the rudder, the, the, the functioning of the rudders, the function of the propeller of, uh, and the strength of the wind and the position every five seconds and so on and reconstruct the whole thing immediately. Yeah, immediately because it's, it, you get the data, the data is collected as Katerina said every five seconds, but then it's sent ashore every five minutes. 
and you can absolutely monitor everything. So going back to George Paul, well, how do you cover the crew negligence clauses and insurance claim? You don't. Essentially, if it is crew negligence, you simply pinpoints it to you at the speed of sound. Oh. <laughs> Didn't follow that. It points to you the speed of sound. <laughs> well, I mean, yes, it tells you essentially, it tells you somebody screwed up. Um, it tells you somebody preferred the, the fuel. I mean, the, the, the mm. whole concept of fuel monitoring, it's not entirely based on the fact that, oh, I have a captain who enjoys going uh, 55 knots without telling anybody and then goes around the <laughs> islands in circle like, like a captain of custody. It's, the whole concept is also to see, is anybody tampering with it? Is, is, uh, you know, uh, is the fuel coming on board uh, the way it should, at the temperature it should, without water and without bubbles of air and, and so on? This is the scope of a performance uh, system. To, to make sure that the performances are the right ones. Well, okay, so we've got two upvotes for Anil Jacob. Maybe you will go to Mateo, I think, to give John Piero a break. What were the main challenges when starting a fleet performance center when you're at your former employer? Do you want to give some thoughts on that one? Your mic's off at the moment. Yes, I can answer that. Okay. Uh, the main challenge is to start of having a the good output, I mean, uh, the, if you do not have uh, the minimum set of data, you cannot have uh, anything. If you do not monitor speed, power and consumption, etc. cetera, uh, the, the first slide that I show, uh, you, you cannot at least start. So the main challenge here is, is that, and if you have already have this, the challenge is to collect all these different type of data. But we are, as I said, we are able to do that. We have a lot of experience. Yeah, I think that slide you showed, I love that model with the, when the goals at the top, because that, that kind of shows, I think there's a lot of shipping companies very confused about how to start with this stuff, you know, getting those pressure from charters and, but you, 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 you mapped that out very beautifully, I think, didn't you? These are, these are the priorities. I think, I don't know if you'll bring that slide up again, but I think it showed um, very, very well what the main challenges are, I think, or, mm -hmm. I mean, a way to start, I think, isn't it? Is a... Yeah. Oh, very good. Okay. So uh, Nick Parks, I don't know if he works in uh, cybersecurity insurance, but he's asking about the uh, secure of the data <laughs> transfer to shore. I don't know uh, who's uh, best to, uh, should we go for Katerina for this one? Are you uh, confident in the security of your data transfer? Yes, uh, we are uh, fully compliant with uh, all the cybersecurity rules uh, current and upcoming is it is a hot topic in our field and uh, we have uh, just set up a uh, few months ago a dedicated uh, department uh, within IB for the cybersecurity staff so everything uh, also from that point of view is under control okay now we've got a software concession a question from your uh, Fabrizio Gambaretto Asking about integrating your system with the plan maintenance and quality management system. I don't know who, which one of you is. A... I, I can reply, of course, absolutely. Uh, of course, uh, the systems are interconnected. There isn't, um, you know, on, on the, for, if you apply, if you use force or if you use uh, performance to do condition based maintenance, absolutely it is connected with plan maintenance. On the quality part, of course, for any non conformity. So we still have not. Uh, raise the automatic no conformity part. You have to link it manually, but of course it will come uh, as uh, as we we move we move ahead. Oh, so Hiro Yoshida is asking about how many years are you keeping the data for the ship owner? Is it a, I guess there's a lot of questions about this. Isn't it? Uh, so the 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 uh, it is the ship owner choice i can tell you this our largest customer has been using the system on 165 ships for the last four years and we just passed now the one terabyte of data remember that we're talking about telemetry here telemetry means that uh, we are sending we're not sending visual information we're sending data and data is uh, bits uh, it's a temperature is a pressure and therefore the quantity, the, the quantity may be massive, but the dimension, the physical dimension of the, of the data that we, we're talking about is so small that uh, our, our servers, we don't foresee the, the, the server on board to be fully loaded during the lifetime of the vessel. And a ship owner can keep the data for a lifetime. I would always tell them to keep them at least for five years, uh, you know, between one special visit and the other. But it very much depends uh, 
you know, on the kind of insurance claims that they can have and so on. For sure, it helps a lot in insurance claims. One, one owner can demonstrate with, in, within seconds that the weather was really bad in the, in the location where the cargo was contaminated by seawater, for instance, just to give you an, an idea. Well, there's a couple of technical questions, but I thought if we go to this human one from Jaco Griffio and Graf Jaco is a lecturer in the uh, in, in Rotterdam, so he's asking about uh, the behaviour of the queue, the queue. Maybe is that for um, Matteo, since you've worked with this? Uh, do you want to talk about how the seafarers enjoyed or didn't your? <laughs> I can say that uh, they, they are not enjoying. <laughs> oh. the, the first reaction, I think, it's okay. They are spying us. <laughs> But uh, it's, so this is the big difficulty to let them understand that is not, not only, <laughs> depending on the ship owner, not only a way to spy on, on and see what happened, but is uh, to achieving all the goals that we we speaking uh, in, in this presentation. But is yes, it is a really um, heavy <laughs> job to do that. And what do you do about it? Do you get a work with the crew and do you get, get over this or not? Uh, yeah, I think that is uh, the, the job of the ship owner to say, okay, this is the system and you have to, to, to use. And so you have to put someone <laughs> to remember the crew that the system is there and sometimes need uh, something, <laughs> you have to call them. I used to do that before <laughs> in my previous job. Oh, very good. You know, Carl, if I can say uh, an old memory, 1989, I had, we had installed uh, Amos on board of um, five um, uh, ferries. And uh, then I get a message and I say, and they tell me uh, it does, the, comp the system doesn't work anymore on one of the ferries. So I went on board of the ferry and uh, the computer had been smashed up to pieces by the chief engineer. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> technology always has some, uh, some, some problems, you know. He, when, when the first cars came out, the cowboys were shooting them because they, <laughs> they, they didn't want them to, to take away their job. But here it doesn't take away any job. It's simply, it should be taken as a way to simplify our activity, of course. This is the main aim. It's, controlling is a subset, but the main aim is simplify, make it better, make it more secure, you know, all the environmental better comply with the rules and regulations smart better. I mean, the, we, we, the system allows to comply with EDI regulation, with SAMP regulations, and with the, with the NOx and SOx regulation much better, much better. Oh, well, we've got four technical questions. And after that, I'd like to get into this whole decision-making process for shipping companies, but uh, maybe we can do all of these. I'm not sure if we covered Vladimir's question about the AI. Anton from iGage in Paris is asking, can you connect to any engine? David Thompson from Aviva is asking about the IT administration on board and how what you do if the vessel is sold. Maybe uh, do you want to take all of those at once? Or? Yeah, sure. Uh, so how do you connect with the, to the engine on board? We connect with the automation plant. So whatever the automation plant is giving us, we, we, we take it. Uh, we have worked uh, with the MAN for one specific customer and we basically have all the uh, pressure curves of every sing, uh, single cylinder line, all the exhaust gas temperature, the, uh, absolutely everything. Whatever is monitored, or ABB, for instance, for the Azipod in another customer and so on, whatever is monitored by them, we, we don't in install hardware except the data collector. And of course, I saw a question before is uh, by a guy called Barry, do you need a flow meter? I repeat, yes, flow meter, torque meter. If you want to analyze fuel consumption and you don't have them, well, you don't do it. I mean, it's a waste of time. Um, Self-service AI module, uh, the, the system is completely configurable. You can also do, uh, use your own mimic and connect your own mimic to the automation. And we worked for, for literally two years on this and it's, it's really excellent. Is there an IT administration requirement board? Absolutely not. Software updates are done uh, via the cloud. So we, we update our customers regularly, absolutely via the cloud without any intervention. Change of ownership, that's mega interested. Interesting. Well, first of all, it, it, it depends if the new owner wants to pay the yearly, the annual fee. And, uh, and if the old owner wants to, the new owner to have all the data. This is a discussion between, between them. We try to be totally in the independent uh, from this point of view. Oh, very good. Yeah, no, what, what I wanted to ask was a theme that came up in a, when we did last week with Orbit, a software company in New York, where they were saying about, you know, the future role is not 
actually making software, is actually making all these modules work together. And I think this theme is also coming out in your talk now. And I think it might be helpful for shipping companies if you're thinking, I don't know which software to choose from. What we're actually saying is you can have lots of different software, but what you really want is somebody who's going to bring all this together and put it together in the right format you want, which I think is also what you're offering here. I don't know if that's something. Um, well, we are we were born as a system integrator, so we definitely have it. It, it also reply a, a little bit the, the the question that is now on the screen by Widow uh, Chu, and that is yeah, we we, we have been asked, for instance, to. Uh, to connect our system to the uh, Deadman uh, uh, bridge button, uh, to to the uh, a chair that would shake in case the captain falls asleep and doesn't move. Um, we can absolutely also bring, of course, the uh, the visualization of the radars, of the actis, of the of any camera, of thermographic camera. The, Technology today is giving us so many possibilities because everything has become possible. Uh, we, the partnership that Katerina was mentioning with Imasat is uh, the, the partnership that we have to work with our free data solution. Free data solution, you can get unlimited data for $400 per, per vessel per one, month. I mean, when I started doing this job 30 years ago, it was unthinkable. We were spent something like that would have cost you a hundred thousand dollars per month of one hundred thousand dollars of thirty years ago. So today is definitely is definitely mega possible to do whatever whatever you want to do. Remember, it's never live; it's near live. So we it's you we record every five seconds. We average. We send back every five minutes. So it's what is called near live. Um, uh, capability, let's put it this way. Oh, well, I've got a question for Matteo. I mean, in terms of managing the complexity, I get the impression that this is getting very complicated for shipping companies. But I mean, ideas like this, you know, there's always different things you can implement, but shipping companies need to be clear about where they're going, like you showed with that goal slide. Do you, do you have any thoughts? How, how do you decide at the former employment how you're going to keep the cha challenge simple and <laughs> something achievable when, uh, without uh, letting the scope get huge? Uh, well, uh, I think that uh, there is uh, maybe uh, the the goal for the for the ship owner also to to have only one system because today we have uh, a lot of uh, partner um, on the ship, the automation, the navigation, etc., etc., etc. So uh, a solution like ours uh, led uh, to to integrate all this kind of information coming from different equipment. And this could be uh, one of the, of the goal of, of the target for, for to be achieved by, by the ship owner. This could be one of the reasons, I think. Well, wow. Katerina, you've been very quiet. Um, I mean, you're, you're the person who actually talks to the shipping companies as the business development manager. <laughs> so uh, what, what, do you want to talk about some of the conversations you're having with customers and what you think customers want and how? Where the challenges yeah. are? Yeah, sure. Uh, the, yes, if I can add uh, and, and comment, uh, um, we are following, of course, the, the, the customer's needs. Uh, and the need is to uh, have the control of the fleet uh, at the glance, so uh, and, and, and data available at the fingertips to, to see real time how the fleet is, uh, is behaving and how to better perform the, uh, the fleet, uh, generally speaking. And uh, on the other side, we also we all, we always have to look at the uh, compliance with the environmental rules. So uh, this is something also that uh, leads, uh, you know, our uh, improvements in, uh, in this industry, which is uh, um, historically quite conservative and it is moving only <laughs> by uh, regulations and rules. And nowadays there are lots and lots of uh, rules to be compliant with. And this is something that also has to be considered uh, in, uh, in our job. Oh, very good. I'm looking up these question answers people on uh, LinkedIn. As you know, I think Philip Long is Senior Officer Digital Development at Wa Kuang Maritime in Hong Kong. So uh, maybe we'll do his, his question next. Um, Will data be clean before analysis? Do you use machine learning for analysis? And how long does the system have to do analysis to become accurate and reliable? Is that for 
John Piero? <laughs> is it yeah, sure. Um, do we clean data? No. Uh, we simply take it and measure it. Of course, the system can can understand uh, can understand um, if uh, if some data is is coming incorrect or is coming randomly. Like uh, I, I just told you, the uh, we we are doing one LNG carrier, and all of a sudden we started to see that the the data was coming randomly instead of coming super regularly like it should. It uh, it came uh, one minute no signal and then three minutes no signal and so on so we were able to pinpoint to a fault in the in the but we don't tamper we don't do anything with the with the data we simply average it uh system use machine learning absolutely we use uh, uh random forest uh, uh methodology let's say but we are open we work with two different universities to uh to perform uh, bi and machine learning but the typical example is that the, the system will be able to advise when uh, the the hull or the propellers are getting dirty enough that uh, you simply don't get uh, uh, you should clean them because you're gonna it's gonna cost you more to keep it running this way than to clean the to clean the hull how long does the system to have to take analysis to become accurate and reliable uh, this i have i need to move it to Matteo, because I have no idea. I think I think okay. it will be, of course, some months, but I have no yes, idea. Uh, yes, yes, uh, it, uh, it requires at least uh, three or six months, but uh, to to let the system learn, <laughs> which which is uh, the, the behavior of the vessel. Well, yeah. I've looked up, but also this. we can implement um, historical data. So if uh, if uh, in in a, in a dedicated output, but of course we can implement historical data. Okay, we've got about four minutes left. I see uh, Fabrizio is the head of CMS with the uh, Columbia Group in Cyprus. So we'll, uh, it's more of a comment here. He's saying, I personally support the idea of uh, you being a data integrator and helping integrate your software with uh, your other software like Amos, ShipNet and external BI. Um, that's not an easy task for ship owners. Um, so he he's uh, sounds like he's happier to have a system integrated than a software company. But <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, today to 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 move uh, from 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 Amos to Shipner, from Shipner to Star Information, from Star to us, etc. It's it's cumbersome. It's uh, complicated. It's expensive. It's uh, annoying. You have to retrain the crew and so on. We are doing system integration, and. Uh, and we hope that uh, you know the market will will come to us for this also. Uh, and I agree with him that it, it is definitely not an easy task. Unfortunately, we have been unable in thirty years uh, to make uniform the data structure of uh, PMS databases, and that means that every time you convert from one system to the other is always uh, is always bad. Um, Vladimir Kozlov, uh, uh, knowledge graph is a new advanced technology we can solve any existing technical management problem. Any plan to implement it? I know a little bit about it. I don't know if we started to, to, to we have uh, in the team, in our team, we have lots of engineers and, and mathematical uh, uh, graduates. And I know that sometimes they talk about things I don't even understand. I think this is all a knowledge graph. Everything you presented, it just means structuring things together in a way that's not a like a box, like an entity relationship table, I think. So it's, no, I'd say I it's all it, a... I, I take it more as a comparison between, uh, but then I, I misunderstood the question, a comparison between, you know, a sort of pre-established graph of how the trends should be and basically compare it, which we do, of course, but uh, I'll, I'll check on that then, I'll check on that. Oh, well, that's fantastic. Well, we're coming up to the end now. Um, I think that's uh, very, very interesting, unless you'd like to take one minute for a final word. Um, maybe go back to Katerina, shall we? And, uh... And then go back to Vidas. Yeah, I would like to let Philip Morin underline the underline the concept uh, that we have been talking before about the the crew and the and the the first approach. Of course, the first approach of implementing such a kind of solution is quite complex. Uh, it could could be uh, like a nightmare because of the reasons that Giampiero and Matteo explained before. But uh, we must see the, um, the target in the medium and long term uh, and uh, consider the solution as a facilitator and an enabler of uh, lots of uh, job on board. For, for example, reducing paper uh, while digital, digitalizing uh, lots of uh, processes, for example, but this is not uh, the only thing. I mean, the, um, uh, what, what is pushing up us uh, in, uh, in, uh, in boosting 
this kind of, uh, of solution is uh, uh, the idea of facilitating the, the, the work uh, on, uh, on board and ashore, of course. Wow, well, thank you. Well, hopefully we're getting a clearer and clearer picture about where we're going with this. It's much harder than anybody thought. So uh, thank you very much. I'll pass back to Vida. Cheers. So you heard the team of IB Marine presenting their concept of fleet uh, remote control center. And now an update about uh, digital ships next week plans. We are inviting you to a discussion type webinar on Tuesday and we'll explore should maritime industry have proactive safety alerting. You may register to attend. Now Digital Ship is signing off. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Oh, Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>